All right. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Um, I guess we'll just let people filter in as we move through the discussion here. Um, we'll go through introductions and then we'll get started. Okay, as you see right now, my name's uh, Pete Mulhern. I'm uh, an engineer with uh, Consumers Energy. I've been working for consumers over uh, roughly over 10 years. Um, I'm here right now also as a representative of the Michigan Society of Professional Engineers. I'm currently the president of the chapter here in Jackson. Um, Rob is our incoming vice president for that organization. And uh, with our tie-ins to that professional engineering organization and some of the desires to talk about engineering and advancements in the, uh, in the community, involvement within the Jackson community of that, uh, they asked us to participate in that. Uh, one of the primary aspects that here in Jackson that we have as far as engineering goes is the, with, is the ties to engineering within the power industry. There's been dramatic, uh, it's been a strong influx of power industry personnel in Jackson. There's a long history of that. Uh, this has always been the home of consumers energy. So uh, being that they're the largest provider for the electric, or one of the largest providers in the state of Michigan for that, uh, and always been headquartered here in Jackson. That's always been one strong tie-in as well. Uh, with that as well, there's always been a large consultant industry in the, within the power uh, industry as well. I keep using the term industry. I keep catching myself saying that. Uh, as well, and that goes back to the Gilbert Commonwealth. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen the large Gilbert Commonwealth building, which is basically right across the street from the current Consumers Energy building. Uh, that was all, um, all power consultants. Um, going way back, and uh, as that company was sold and diverse, we still have other smaller now entities of uh, power consultant firms that are here in Jackson as well. And uh, Rob works with one of those in GII Consultants. As it kind of comes through. Uh, I've been a licensed engineer here in Jackson, in, in Michigan since 2006. And uh, I'm right now currently in charge of uh, all of the high voltage lines that Consumers Energy um, puts up and manages and maintains throughout the uh, throughout the state. So I can go on through that. And I'll let Rob explain some of the things that he's currently working on. Rob Wheeler, uh, I work with uh, GAI Consultants in town. And uh, as Pete mentioned, there's uh, been a, a large group of consultants in the Jackson area uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, Consumers is only one of the utilities in this region and uh, quite a few of the, the companies in Jackson work all the way down into Indiana and southern Ohio um, and even into Kentucky and uh, as far out east as Pennsylvania. Um, so we've got a nice widespread, uh, we've got our fingers into a lot of the regions uh, in the Midwest. Um, and so there are three uh, consulting firms in Jackson. I work at GAI Consultants. Um, I've been doing uh, transmission design for five years. Uh, I've been uh, licensed since 2011, and I'm licensed in uh, Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, so I can practice in all those areas. Um, and as Pete mentioned, I, I'm, uh, I'm involved with the Michigan Society of Professional Engineers. Uh, I've been the secretary for three years, and next year I'll be the vice president. So with that, we'll get into the discussion, which is the power grid and the basics of design. So, uh, yeah, one of the things here is this document kind of shows is how power flows throughout the process. It's generated, obviously, at the generating plant. Now, we just put a block here to represent the generating plant, but there's obviously many forms of uh, power is how it's generated. I'm sure a few of you guys can name a few of the different forms of how power gets generated. You've got wind power, solar power, you've got coal, gas, a whole variety of things. We'll show some of that later, but this is our block indicating where the generating plant kind of comes from right now. Now, where this goes from, how does it get to the generating plant? To your house. And this is the diagram that's showing through here. Uh, first thing that will come in, we go as the plant, is we step up the voltage. The, wouldn't be too good to be generating the facilities that they have from those plants at uh, 345,000 volts. We try to have, have it minimized with the amount of power that it's coming through. But for efficiencies that are go with the system, we step that voltage up in order to distribute it further out. Now, as we first step it up, it's in mass. It's all just one portion of the plant. 
So we step it up at a high volume level so that it makes it easier to distribute further out to the community. And so we step it up through our transformers that go in through there. And then it's distributed further out and taken out into the high voltage, into the high voltage transmission system, which uh, ranges from what we have, 69 kV. KV is 1,000. We tend to talk KV instead of 1,000 volts. But it's 69,000 volts to 345,000 volts, up to 500,000 volts at some times before, which at your house is 120 volts. Yes. <laughs> So there's a significant difference that we kind of got from there. Uh, the high voltage transmission, usually in this representation, kind of is at 345,000 volts. You get a voltage reduction. The voltage reductions, those pieces of equipment that reduce that voltage down, usually they're called transformers. They're very large boxes, and the ones that are in the substations at your house, they're a small gray can hanging up on a pole, or in a green box that's in your front yard if you have underground service that's in your neighborhood that, that way. Uh, it's the same type of equipment, it's just determining on the voltage and the size, the amount of power that, it, that, that is uh, being transformed helps determine the size of the piece of equipment as well. It steps up, it reduces down there, and is now coming into what sometimes people refer to as a sub-transmission system, or just even still part of the transmission system. It gets into the technicalities of, of definition that get into the business, but uh, kind of comes through there, and it reduces down again. Each time it's doing that, the fingers kind of get spread out in terms of how it's expanding out into the community and, the, and, the, and across the country as well for how the electricity is being distributed. We go through that. After it comes through that second reduction, sometimes with our large customers, we get to a Ford plant, consumer, you know, our, our large facilities that we have, we're working elements, they'll take that voltage right there and start distributing the power that's needed to work the, the machinery and uh, motors, the, gener the facilities that they have located within, the, uh, within their business product. And uh, with their manufacturing cars, whether they're manufacturing, especially in the auto industry here and being Michigan, cars being a big predominantly, they have a large power that they're coming through. So they'll be fed right off those voltages right off the bat because those facilities are so large, take up so much power. That tends to be the best economic factor for which they can get the amount of power that they have transmitted to be used for their facilities. We then, though, since not everybody is, uh, has the size of machinery that is at a Ford plant at their location, we will still further break it down to another voltage to further distribute and spread out into the, uh, further out into the community. And uh, that gets down into our, what we call our high voltage distribution system. Again, it's voltage related based on definition, but it gets further out as what we go through. A lot of that will then get to smaller corporations, some commercial industries, large buildings, community colleges, some other sorts of the nature that would have their power as it's being fed, we'll get a lot of the work that kind of comes through from this level. We'll take that and uh, distribute again, and it'll be transferred at that point as well. Mostly what comes into your house is taken down to another level, which we call our distribution substations. It'll take the high voltage distribution and break it down to what we call our primary or low voltage distribution circuits. Those are the circuits that you see in your houses and in your neighborhoods. The main voltages that are coming through that, that is what it's coming from. It's coming from those transform from that thing. So if there's wires that are hanging out, you see out in front of your house, that's usually where it is within the system. It's at this portion where it's coming from the distribution system, out. So that wires that are there, you see them coming modeling through the house, through the community to the house, that's what those are. Those are your low voltage distribution primary circuit aspects. The old feeding powers come off of that, feed your lights, feed your other aspects, but uh, they're there. From that is where it breaks down and takes it through the transformer that feeds your house. So when you work through the community, the neighborhoods, and you see those big gray cans, a lot of those, a majority of them are transformers, and that's where the voltage is breaking down again. Each one of these steps is a breakdown in voltage. The voltage gets lower in its terms. It's not always a breakdown in total power because the power consumption is the same. Uh, mathematically, it means if you lower the voltage, the current is going higher. Switch the code to that. Once it gets each one of these load factors, or each time something's being used for production, or your house, or you're turning a light on, it takes a little bit off that circuit, and that's how we can reduce some of the current that we have, and how it all gets reduced down off of the system as it gets to your house. So the voltage is lower, the, the power consumptions that are lower is what comes down to your house as, as it breaks down, but it's just a huge finger network in a sense of how these are interconnected and looped through. 
think that's basically your description that I can go through on that. Michael, next. I'll get into uh, some of the basics of power generation here and some of the descriptions of, of the generation side of the grid. Um, power generation, uh, in most cases, involves spinning a, spinning a turbine using steam. And we make that steam out of various fuel sources, uh, coal being the biggest one. We burn coal, it obviously gets hot, and it creates steam. And we use that steam to drive a turbine which spins a magnet inside of a coil of wires. And that's, that's where it comes from. All it is is a giant tea kettle. Every power plant is essentially just a big tea kettle. The, the exceptions to those are obviously wind. You still got a turbine. It's just being turned by the wind. Solar, you obviously just have a stationary face plate that's absorbing the sun's energy um, and creating electricity that way. It's, that one's probably the biggest difference out of all of them. But, Nuclear, coal, geothermal, all of that stuff, the whole point of all of it is to make water hot. The exclusion again would be the hydro plant. That's your, your yep. dams that we see have and use right. that are used for electric power. Um, that's, this is where we, we call this three phase, three phase power. And uh, you can see this, this little photo down here. This is, uh, this is what the, the voltage looks like. As it, at the generating facility, they generate three separate waves of power coming out of the facility, and they're all 120 degrees uh, phase shifted from one from one another, and that's the most efficient way that we can uh, transmit power out of the facility. Um, we could go to four phase, we could go to five phase, but the cost to implement those systems is, is uh, you get a lot of diminishing returns at some point. So we stick with the three-phase system. Here's a picture of a turbine that I was just discussing. You spin, you spin a magnet out, out on the end of this turbine. You force steam through there. It hits all those little turbine blades. And it, and it turns this gigantic shaft. There's a magnet attached to the other end of here. And, it's, and it turns inside of a, a coil of wire. Um, the generation voltages uh, are typically 2.3 to 22 kV. This one's probably a little bit different since it's in Germany. I can tell from that sign. So step back once for a bit. He's, he's referencing the magnet. It kind of goes, we all know magnets have polarity to them. There's the positive side, the negative side, north, south, whatever we have on a polar side. As they spin, you know, it's the strength of that magnet in terms of its attraction or repellent aspect that you have within the magnet. And as you model that, in referencing the same point, one point it's going to be real strong, and the opposite side of it is going to be real weak. And it's going to transition as you kind of go through. That's what that wave is. Each one of those colors is that one point of the magnet as it goes around the circle, going around. That's where he's coming through when he goes into the three phase. There's three elements in terms of how they went. We said 120 degrees apart. You have a full circle, magnets set equally, three different magnets in a sense that are equally, they'll be 120 degrees apart. That's how the magnet comes through and transitions through. That's what that is, is a model of that strength of that, which is the alternating current and, uh, and how that's described. So just to kind of relate the magnets that you're seeing, how the turbine's causing it, that's what the pose is. If you guys play with magnets, you can use those magnets to create some power some more. Yeah. You can actually do a pretty simple experiment to kind of recreate the driving force of magnetism on uh, using a compass and a wire. Yeah. If you just have a battery and you connect the negative and positive terminals and you take your compass, like you know, pointing north, and you set your compass on top of that wire, the magnetic field that's generated from the electricity running through that wire will actually turn your, mag your compass 90 degrees. So it's the same force that we're, we're, you, we're harnessing that, that uh, principle of physics to send electricity to your house. And the thing that always, uh, well not always because I was unaware that it was happening for most of my life, but the thing that's really amazing to me about power is there is no connection, there's no physical connection from the power plant to your house. 
the, the transformers that Pete was talking about inside of the, you know, the big ones at the substation. Uh, there's just windings inside of there, and there's no physical connection. They're just next to each other on the inside. And that same force we were talking about that drives that compass to turn is the same magnetic force that transfers across these two big coils inside of the, well, there's more than two, but these big coils inside of a transformer. There's no physical connection at all. Nothing is touching. But when you flick that light switch, it comes on. It's amazing to me. <laughs> OK, so a couple of the design considerations for, for engineers uh, and power plant side. Um, and neither Pete or I actually designed power plants, which is probably why this list is so short. <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, that you have to consider fuel source types, uh, power generation capacity. Uh, there's a large group of people that study uh, load growth curves. They make projections on what does the power grid look like today, what does the population look like in the areas, uh, and then how can we support those growing, uh, those growing trends of people in, in load. Because as time goes on, we're using more and more uh, electricity per capita. And I think each one of us in here can probably say that the, just 10 years ago in time, they probably were not using as much electricity as they are now. How much more bigger televisions, more uh, electronic games that are being interconnected, uh, the lights, the things that are being left on that power all of these things. There's a lot more electrical ins installed power issues that kind of come through. Brighter lights, more lights, just using lighting. Larger air conditioners, you know, uh, even getting the heaters, stoves, all of that kind of situation that are even of electric services is continuously being added and utilizing the, that uh, electricity regularly. And that's part of that curve aspect, evaluating the power flow and, and trying to study how much more of that is being added every year. Right. Uh, location is actually a huge issue, especially when you start talking about nuclear power and. Uh, Everybody's afraid of nuclear power because of, obviously we had Fukushima in the last year. That scared everybody. Nobody wants the power plant to be built in their backyard. That's the, the NIMBY principle. Um, but they're necessary. I mean, we have to have them if we want to continue to uh, consume as much energy as we're consuming and, and keep our lights on at a reliable level. We have to, we have, to have these things. They're kind of a necessary nuisance for, for people. Um, Cost is obviously another big driver. Uh, that's probably inherent in all of engineering. We're always trying to save, save costs so that we can keep, you know, keep the rate, the rates, the electric rate rates as low as we possibly can. Um, and then the environmental aspects to it are, you know, that's actually becoming more and more. Not that it's already not important. Uh, you know, the permitting side is becoming more and more uh, of a big driver on projects. That has a double impact in terms of what you're seeing in reference to cost. You have the cost of uh, you know, equipment to try and eliminate the cost to the environment, you know, in a sense of what it kind of comes through. Uh, you know, went through a few other experiments in some other rooms before where they show uh, the effect of something that's happening, but sometimes how does that effect expand on the, how do you neutralize certain elements within that uh, is a high cost element. And so you have to try to weigh the best plus and minus of the environmental costs, how to reduce those as much as we possibly can without increasing the cost to uh, the customers is what would be beneficial. You know, I mean, you can see that if we capped all of these and captured all of the gas coming out of those uh, turbine things, then okay, nothing would be getting into the environment, but you know how much it would cost to completely cap everything that would go through there it would cause your rates to be dramatically higher and we're way up there uh, when it comes into some of that. There's that cost-benefit portion as to what's acceptable for the community. Yeah, we have a question. And then the problem is if you cap them, where will all that exhaust go? Well, it would be capped, so it would be included. With, you'd have to come up with some element that would be utilized to cap that. So that cost of creating that piece of equipment that would be there to capture that, right now, we can't do, you know, I'm sure that somebody would be able to come up with something, but I don't think it would be what we would want to pay to have to come up with. Yeah, to clean the air up 100%, to give it the same 
concentrations of nitrogen, oxygen, whatever comes out of the stack, yeah, it would cost a lot of money. So, um, we'll go on to one of the other things. We talked about the areas that where the voltages are broken down at, which we consider to be called as a substation. A lot of you guys may have seen these in the community. I mean, here's one we can kind of see just outside fence row, not too far away. We're, we're just in the middle of a field, and here's a, a thing. This is a breakdown of voltage here, what we call one of our distribution ones. Uh, it's the uh, higher voltage is coming in, and then the lower voltages are coming through, coming out. Uh, from the left side of the screen is actually the higher voltage side. You can tell us it's coming through the higher portions of the uh, equipment to the top. Uh, higher voltages for safety purposes. You tend to be a little bit further from distance. You separate things a little bit more. Um, safety is included a lot in our valuations to try and work. If we have concerns for our workers as well as the, the general public to try and maintain our safety considerations. So it comes in through the high side, breaks down to the transformer, which is a large box to the left of the ground there. And, uh, and as it exits from there, there's other wire connections that then transfer straight down below and exit out that side. There's equipment that's done to be able to transfer, shut off, turn on for safety purposes for uh, considerations that go on through, and then it comes out through the distribution circuits that are, as you tend to see within your neighborhood, the wood poles that are in the background. Uh, some of the things that we, we do evaluate within that is, it's like I said, we put the layout here. Um, it's, there's a lot of involved with the equipment that Rob was kind of breaking down in terms of just how that transformer functions and the amount of information that's needed to evaluate that, there's a lot of technical data that comes in through that. Uh, as it's through, I actually used to design those when I first got out of school. So I have a little knowledge of what kind of goes through on that side. And there's a lot of information that kind of comes from that. And there's departments that are just dealing with those pieces of equipment because they're so specialized, there's so much information that kind of goes through with that. Um, the uh, SPC, which is Billy, the spill prevention and uh, control me measures, counter control measures that we would have. Um, what's inside that is large pieces of oil. The minimum oil as far as we kind of go through. Um, and there's a mechanism within that substation to make sure that that oil doesn't get out into the environment. That we can capture it, we can take control of it, and make sure that nothing has an impact further out into the community beyond that fence line. Um, it's not visible right there, but we do have pits and other things that are there that are available right at that spot to collect all that information. It's part of our environmental evaluations and considerations and concerns that we always try to make sure that we do maintain within the industry um, that are in there. This is just one within the substation organization. So we've got safety situations that we prevented with maintaining proper distances, collection of potential um, hazard issues that would be done with the chemicals, although they're fairly well not considered to be a hazardous in the chemical in and amongst itself, but it's still a collection system because I don't think anybody really wants oil getting further out into their yards. So that's what comes through here. Here's kind of a, a, a mechanism that we do a lot in terms of modeling that is this shows the contours land of the flow and how the oil would come and rest in what direction it would flow. You know, you can, you've seen contour maps. I don't know how many of you have seen it before, but basically each one of those lines represents a change of one foot in height, vertical height. And it's also one or so feet out in uh, horizontal distance. So you have a combination of the two to model the ge geography of the, the, the topography of, of the land. And that helps determine, try and create it. As you can see, um, in the center there's a flow that goes downward. It kind of looks like a mountain top in the peak. Why? Because that's where you want the center so that it flows away from a piece to the points where they're trying to collect the material to where it can be gathered. So they're creating the ground to have a natural flow so that it will flow into those collective spots uh, as it kind of comes through. So it's design criteria that we have with the soil meeting conditions, how we're, how we're planting the soil conditions so that that best could be utilized to collect all of the stuff. Yeah? Actually, if you look at the top, it looks like it's actually 3D. It, this is right here. That is in a 3D photograph aspect. The map that we took that from is a 3D program. So this yeah, we do use three-dimensional program. This one's not. That's two-dimensional. Yeah, but it looks like it's 3D because of all lines. It looks like it's. Oh yeah. It kind of does present that, doesn't it? You, you can kind of see it. If you stare long enough, it will be 3D. I imagine in your mind. <laughs> so you might have to blink to get rid of the lines, but. <laughs> uh, 
This didn't come out as well as we had hoped when I got the photos. I didn't think it was going to work as bad. My, when all my pictures, when it was a little darker, it was easier to see. Uh, this is what we have modeling as a representation. You can just flow on to the next one, though. But um, it's a representation of the same grid, which this is an overhead of each one of those blocks that we just saw in the previous picture. You see the transformer here. You see the line kind of coming over the top. The exit's going out to the other side um, as it kind of came through. Uh, this is a side view of this as a, of, a, of a similar model that's kind of come through. This one's got a control house in it, so this one is a lot exactly the same one. Um, and so you kind of view what it comes through. That's where we calculate our heights, make sure that we got everything through. There's a lot of different perspectives. If you guys have ever done a lot of drawings or drafting organizations, you'll see how these things are utilized to help us supplies different views, give you a different perspective. And we need to use all of those views when you're looking at things to design, uh, especially on a structural aspect. Architects use it regularly. And it's, it's done into other aspects within engineering to where you look at these dimensions and side layouts. If you ever seen your own house, they've got the same type of layouts for housing layouts when an architect is doing your house or a building or any infrastructure. There are drawings for this building and this room here that will have these same types of views and layouts that are used for them. We just take that into another point. The previous map, the, the one that I passed through, actually is an elect, what we call a one-line electric drawing. It's just kind of a flow of how the electricity is flowing in a single point. It's like, okay, it just kind of goes through this piece, goes through this piece. This operational piece that is showing is one that will help separate it if there's a problem. If uh, the line falls down, we don't want electricity continuing to try and go through if it touches the ground. There's pieces of equipment that measure, because um, when it hits the ground, it does change the characteristics of electricity. And monitors the, monitoring those characteristics to pro provide a better, safer environment so that we can make sure that it's taken care of quickly uh, is what we try to do. And those, there are certain devices that are in there. A lot of that previous document had uh, a symbology that would represent what each of those type of those devices work, how they do it. Here's one that represents the monitoring device. Here's one, the actual physical device that's going to open, like your fuses or your breakers that you have at your house. Those would be monitoring. Some of those is exactly what we're looking at even in here is large breakers large fuses, large switches, like your light switch. It's all oper operational representation that's in there. There's another one right? we kind of got through here where there's the substation. This is a little bit more directly from the one that we did just see, where it's coming from the high side, comes down out through the low. Uh, this is substation transformer. This one obviously is in our standard Michigan winter, so you can see uh, the snow outside and they're coming through. but. Uh, in, in the same winter side view with the control house and, and some of the other pieces. The ones right in here, center, circle, center, yeah, those pieces, that's your breakers. Different than the breaker you have at your house for obvious reasons. They have a lar much larger current that we're trying to break when we come through. But that is the breakers that we have. And uh, uh, they will operate, and they're significantly louder when they operate as well. There's a good bang when those things go off. And uh, we've had people that will say, we would call our community and indicate when, those, when they've gone out that they sounds like a gunshot in some lines. So they, they had reports a few times that they thought they heard a gunshot when it was a breaker where it was being operated, sometimes just even being tested, but it comes through that way. Those breakers will break that current in milliseconds. They're designed, they yes. have gigantic springs inside of them. They, they will, when, when it goes off, you know it. <laughs> And actually, we customize a lot of things that we deal with. We just saw the substation we had before. This is a substation that is just like that one that we had there. It, it put it into a community aspect that was required so that uh, you can't see it. So we try to be as accommodating we can to certain environmental aspects. This is a lot more significantly more expensive than the previous one. Uh, but, uh, but you wouldn't know too much in passing. You would think you were just passing someone's house, but that actually is an electric power substation. Um, just to kind of go over what we had already talked about, a lot of the structure and foundation issues. Uh, we're dealing with the control house considerations. Um, the size of the substations is dramatic and physical based on how they're at, where they're located within the system. Um, we said that there's substations. Every one of those voltage breakdown points is usually some form of a substation. 
And the larger the voltage level is on the high side that's coming through, the greater the size of that substation is going to be. And so how much space is needed for that, how much power is flowing through that is significant when it goes through a lot of that. Um, we always have to design thinking not only of what, what the function of it is as well, but how are we going to make sure that that thing keeps working. So you want to be able to make sure that the safety considerations for your employees, your neighbors, your friends that are working for the company are going to be able to come back and be back at their house the next day. Uh, because electricity is, it does kill. It can kill, I should say. And so, you know, we have to make sure that the safety parameters are there when we design our infrastructure and think about what's the best options that we can do for safety and making sure everybody comes back and that these operate safely and are, are safe for everyone. Um, there's a lot of information that kind of goes through with it. We kind of mentioned before the indications of finding when they, uh, the devices that can measure when there's a problem, that it sends those signals back to some other devices to make sure that these things operate protectively uh, to make sure that the system doesn't get damaged. I do not want to have a transformer blow up every single time that there's a fault on the, current, on, on the system. I don't, those things cost a million dollars a piece. Easy. That's the small ones. So when you start getting into the large, I, I have, to, you know, it's worth my money to make sure that thing gets protected regularly and works and lasts a long time. It's the best for the investment of our, our customers, the best for the investment for ourselves. And um, so we make sure that's where the relay protections, communications are, are there. We try to make sure we deal with standards to, to incorporate that so that everybody always knows what our distances are. We try to keep it as simple as butter. That's better for the people working on it workers working on it. It's just a mindset you have to have always is to think not only of what yourself, it's all those others that are available to be working around and how it affects everybody else. And then just even to the levels of ergonomics and safety, you know, uh, we're getting more and more asked, you know, can we do it differently than cranking on this wrench which gives the guy, you know, uh, some form of tennis elbow in a sense if you want to say or something to that extent. We want to eliminate those situations. And uh, so can we change the direction or can we do a different thing or can we add a device that's differently? Those are things that are always being looked at throughout the industry. Go. Okay. And then uh, one of the other interfaces on the other side of a substation is the transmission grid, which Pete had mentioned earlier uh, is 69 to 765 kV, um, 1,000 volts once again. Um, and the reason we uh, transmit the power at such high voltage is because the losses due to heat on the system are uh, actually in direct association with the current squared. So if we transmit it at, at whatever the load was at, at a lower voltage, we would lose a ton of energy in heat. So that's why we have really high voltage. We try and keep the current as low as possible so that we can keep the losses on the line to the heat uh, manageable. Um, this, this segment of the, of the grid moves the power from the generation to the customers. You know, there's, there's a step up from the uh, generation side and then a step down again into other transmission voltages and then into a sub-transmission and high voltage uh, distribution voltage. Um, we use uh, some specialized programs to do our analysis on these. Uh, we model all the structures and the insulators and uh, lengths. Uh, and this program specifically lets us uh, model any weather case that we would like. Uh, in Michigan, we specifically designed to uh, half inch ice on every wire radially. So you have one inch ice and then a 40 mile an hour wind blowing on that expanded wire diameter. Every single wire has that uh, wind pressure blowing on it and so our structures have to maintain uh, their stability under that load. And that's our basic, you know, I don't know how often that happens, but that's a pretty low probability event. So we've been through winter storms. I think everybody knows what those can be. Right. Um, some of the major design considerations for uh, transmission. I'm going to skip some slides here. No. I'll have to go back. Of course. Back 
but it's not working. No. Um, and then some of the design documents we use to, to track all of our, our changes to the system is we use the planning profile where we show what the line looks like from an overhead view, similar to this here with the photo. Um, we show it from an overhead view and we put whatever information uh, the utility wants us to include on there, structure numbers, uh, span lengths, wire types. Uh, and then we also look at it in the profile view to make sure that we keep clearance to uh, vertically to the ground, of course, um, and then to any buildings or whatever else may, may be underneath of the transmission line. Um, the design considerations for transmission, um, one of the things that we always look at uh, up front or, or the utilities always look at is can we get away with, uh, you know, do we need to replace this whole line of structures here? Or is it just this one structure right here? This, you know, one of the legs is really rusted out. Well, we don't need to replace all of them. We can just go out and repair that one or just replace that structure. So we always try and get that question answered up front. The utilities usually have that question answered for us already. but. Um, and then we get into the structure material. Do we want to go with uh, in configuration? This is a lattice tower. Um, and these are fully customized structures. You can design them for as long a span as you want, for as high a tension as you want on the wire. Um, they are quite a bit more expensive to assemble. Um, but there's also steel poles, wood poles, concrete poles. Any kind of pole you can think of, fiberglass, uh, laminated wood poles. There's a variety of structures that, that we can utilize to basically just to keep the, the wires off the ground. Um, one of the other things we look at is the size of the wire. The electrical planners at the utilities tell us what size wire we, we want to use to meet the electrical load that they want to utilize on this line. So. The conductor size, the, the size of that wire has, has a lot to do with, with how much uh, power you can put through the wire. And one of the funny things about all the wires is they're all named after birds. So this one could be, I don't know, it's probably bundle, bundle rail. Rail is a thing. Rail, <laughs> drake, falcon, there's all kinds of, they're all named after birds though. Um, Soil types, uh, civil structural is always, you know, you have to look at the soil. You can't, you can't set one of these structures in the middle of a swamp, it'll sink. Um, so we have to make sure that the ground that the foundation sits on is, is uh, stable enough and can adequately resist all those wind forces on the tower. Or if one of the wire breaks, what does it do to the tower? Uh, the foundations all have to hold under all those loads. Uh, you can make the structure as sturdy as you want. If you don't build it on the correct foundation, it's going to fall down. So we do that. We try and minimize the impact to the environment and structure locations. We try not to put them in the middle of farmer's fields. We try not to put them in your backyard. We try not to put them in your garage. Uh, <laughs> even though people sometimes build garages on high voltage power lines. Or around they have the poles. Some sort of death wish. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we also study routing. Can we move it around somebody who is just really dislikes the power company and they're just going to destroy the schedule on the project? Well, what's, maybe it's cheaper for us to just go around. So we take all those things into consideration when we're, you know, uh, I had one, uh, one job that went, they wanted to take the line through a national forest and that was just an absolute nightmare. To, try and get that permitted. So we just went around. We were close enough to the edge of the National Forest where we just went around and got to the same spot. There are things in routing that you can't cross at all. You know, and there's ones you can get special permits for, but for example, you won't you won't see a transmission line ever going over a graveyard. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. That's kind of just, you know, a standard practice. We won't put anything like that because we can't over a graveyard. Archaeological site digs that are known; those aren't to be, you know, 
we have to avoid it. So additions, you know, we have certain things that have to be avoided. Right? So. so we try and get all those out of the way at the beginning of the projects, and we'll spend a lot of time starting to build these and then find an Indian burial ground. So uh, switching, uh, in order to do maintenance on these lines, we have to switch, switch them. Sometimes we do them on the transmission structure. Sometimes we do them at the substation. Um, but it's something we have to keep track of during the, during the project because contractors don't like to work on them while they're at 345,000 volts. They can, but that's very expensive and very dangerous. So we try and uh, put switching in on the line so that we can move the power from different parts of the grid uh, and we don't have to work on it hot. Uh, communication. Um, with uh, with the interconnectedness of today's grid, we, we always like to have communication lines between substations and uh, at generation facilities for a variety of reasons. Uh, like people saying, if you have a tree fall on one of the lines that you just created a path to ground and all the power in the entire grid wants to go right to that tree because it found a path to ground. So you've got to have breakers go off. There's got to be communication that if breakers go off here, what is that going to do to power out in Detroit? We've got to track all of that information has to be tracked by somebody. So we have to have uh, fiber optic lines. Uh, sometimes we use the conductors for communication. Sometimes we put fiber optic up on the tower of this peak up here. We'll call it optical ground wire. There's fiber optics in there. And uh, sometimes you use telephone wire. You Microwaves, Microwaves variety, radio signals. Yeah. Um, safety, as I was saying earlier, safety is always a big issue. Um, we try and maintain all of our clearances to wires, ground, trees, everything. Those are our, our major concerns. Got to go quickly through this one. Yeah, yeah, your time. Huh? Yeah, no. Been through. Yeah, be clicking. Um, here's what you can see. This is the distribution system. That's the part we got through. This is the last stages that went through the substation. Uh, here's your wood poles that you can kind of see that are all throughout our community as we kind of go right now. And right there above uh, is the gray can. It's the transformer, the last transformer that's breaking it down from the primary voltage here to the other thing. The primary voltage is usually, and the consumer system can go anywhere from 24,000 volts to uh, 2,000 volts, depending on where you are in the system, when it was initially installed and how much power is flowing off of it. So, go ahead. Um, there's multiple considerations. Again, it's a lot of similar to the same problems that we have. Material size, configuration issues, uh, structural evaluations, switching and communication paths that he just went through again. Those are also done in the distribution system as well. All right. In the discussion of the existing infrastructure, we have about 75,000 megawatts of generation in the US. 164,000, I believe that's uh, circuit miles yeah. of transmission, uh, and 3,000 utilities across the U.S. Um, our fuel sources, you can look at the breakdown here. Notice the uh, difference uh, in coal from 2000 to 2010. We significantly reduced our coal consumption, and that's primarily due to the increase in our natural gas consumption. So there's a lot fewer coal plants being built uh, than there were and we're kind of subsidizing and using the, nat the cheap natural gas that we're getting now. Uh, we've also got some significant gains in wind and solar, uh, even though they're still only some parts of this 5%. Um, but the, the generation side has changed quite a bit in just those 10 years. Um, in 2003, I don't know if, uh, how many of you remember this, but uh, Part of the reason that there's so much work going on in the power grid right now is there was a, a blackout in 2003. And you can see here, if you look at the rest of the US, that's where 50 million people live, right there. And here's Lansing right here, this dot. And then here's Jackson right on the edge. So we were relatively unaffected by the blackout. And this is actually at 11:15 uh, at night. The blackout started occurring at uh, four o'clock earlier that day, and they still hadn't had their power back on for quite some time. Um, this was a this was kind of a cascading failure of, of problems on the power grid. Um, 
It started with a power plant being taken offline for maintenance issues in, in eastern Ohio, the utility to be unnamed. Uh, <laughs> and what happened was when that, when that went offline, the grid shifted its power to other power lines and then the line sagged into a tree, which caused that line to trip and then it caused a series of cascading failures of other lines and, and took everybody out. And that's what happened. 11 deaths, six billion dollars. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> we can just show some good data, you know. This is what we deal with on maintenance issues, breakdowns. You can kind of see what we run through on the pictures. Right. Um, typical project process. Here's my sign. Math is hard, so is life. Get over it. Future of energy. Some of the systems we're looking to input. Some of the future uh, sources of energy in the U.S. And we don't have time for questions. So.